Chicago, great city by the shore, the city of big shoulders, where European immigrants from the east shared crowded concrete corridors with African-American migrants from the deep south. They came from places like Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Tennessee to a new promised land. They headed to Chicago, a land full of contrasts and contradictions, of penalties and promises, of tragedies and togetherness. They escaped hopelessness buoyed by the hope that once they arrived in this thriving industrial urban Mecca, they would begin new lives for themselves and their loved ones. Once they arrived in the Windy City, they began heading west. Everywhere you could see was family, family, family. It was a nitty-gritty type existence over there. It was a center of recreation for us. It represented opportunity. The richness of the culture, that southern culture, is embedded here on the west side. Everybody was like built-in babysitters. You turn to your neighbors for everything. You learn to protect your neighbor. Even before Chicago was founded as a city, Chicago's black base, although small, was as evident as its rich soil and waters. By the time Jean-Baptiste Point de Sable founded the area that is now known as Chicago, Chicago had a population of hundreds of people of African-American ancestry. Just after the turn of the century, the West Side was populated by blacks taking part in the post-World War migrations. Heading West reflects on the stories of individuals and institutions that made the Old West Side a special place for millions of Chicagoans of African-American ancestry. By remembering the culture that created a rural reality in an urban setting like Chicago. Heading west reconnects the ties that bind the old west side to a new west side. The west side is the area of the, of, of the city's oldest continuous African-American settlement. Uh, there were people there in 1837 when the city was chartered as well as in the South Loop area. But as people in the South Loop started to move farther and farther south, uh, into what was going to become Black Metropolis or Bronzeville, people on the west side were still around the Lake Street area, the Lake Street corridor between Racine 1200 West and let's say uh, Ashland 1600 West and then later 2400 West Western and then down to California 2800 West. The near west side has always been or was certainly historically uh, the main point of entry area for newcomers to the city. In the early days uh, immigration was fed largely through the railroad depots, which ex uh, existed just across the Chicago River. The old Dearborn Street Station was uh, the main station for passenger trains coming from New York. Immigrants in the 1890s, uh, 1880s, 1890s, and so on were uh, coming by boat, going through Ellis Island, and really bypassing New York during this later period because there were jobs that were available in Chicago. And uh, they would come on trains and with their bags walk across the river into the first area of settlement, and that was the near west side. And then during the 1880s and 90s, uh, it became a great center for industry because railroads were coming into the city from uh, all points of the Midwest bringing in raw material and factories were springing up along the banks of the river. This was one of the river wards of the city and, and attracted immigrants. Well, it was a nitty gritty type existence over there. Black people were integrating a, a white community made up of some recent immigrants who didn't know that they were supposed to be anti-black. Uh, I've seen pictures of black people being invited to Italian weddings before the Italians became indoctrinated. Even in 1913, an awareness on the part of people at Hull House that African Americans were facing special kinds of problems that, that immigrant groups before had not. Well, you were leaving behind every kind of Jim Crow law you could think about. 
Well, my grandparents came here in 1919 from North Carolina. My grandfather came here because the church next door to where they lived, 2006 Washington, called him to be the pastor of that church, and that's the reason they came. They came just in time for the 1919 race riots, however, and uh, as soon as they moved into 2006, they received a note threatening the lives of my aunt and my mother. So they had to move them and my grandmother out of the house and my grandfather, uh, his brother-in-law and some of the other men of the church stayed in the house with shotguns and waiting for anybody that came. <laughs> Nobody came. My grandparents on my mother's side migrated here in the late 40s. In fact, my grandfather sent my grandmother with money to purchase a building. She stayed here for a year looking for a building. They're from Mississippi and Tennessee, and she had a hard time finding a building because she was an African-American woman uh, in the late 40s. And so she was able to work with a, a Jewish lawyer, and she became very fond of Jewish people as a result of this, she used to tell me. And, and they were able to secure a building at 16th and Holman. But unfortunately, there was a lot of racism. And what happened when my mother, my grandmother did get the building, her and my grandfather were forced to live in the basement for a while, even though they owned the building, because once the people who owned it found out blacks had bought it, they refused to leave for a while. They drug their feet. From the very beginning of the Black West Side experience, the church provided sanctuary and social structure for its growing community. The first church was Providence, now known as Original Providence. It was founded in 1863 uh, in the area around Union Park. And it was followed within nine years by St. Stephen AME. So those are the mother churches of those two denominations. Friendship Baptist, was formed in 1897. Greater Union followed about 10 years later, and the Metropolitan Missionary Baptist Church was, was, was on the scene by the 1920s. The churches got their start back in the 1860s, 1870s to meet the special needs of African Americans. And the interesting thing about Providence Baptist, now original Providence, is that that church was formed out of a white church, an integrated church. There was something missing in church services, in the spirit of the church, and a small body of people, African Americans, moved out, cooperated with the white congregation that they had left for years until they got a minister over at Providence. But then when they struck out, what they did was they had a spirit that they hadn't found before in their church. And they had sermons that seemed to be more relevant to their lives, a special emphasis on scripture. And that church hit the ground and has been going now for 130 years. The family um, was fortunate enough to establish five churches on the west side. The earliest one was started by my grandparents, Della Hudson and, and William Hudson. And uh, there was at 1134 South Francisco, missionary, uh, New Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church. And I had a lot of uh, memories there. Just like Hebrew children crossing over the Jordan River to the Promised Land, the newly arrived migrants crossed the Chicago River and found in the black churches, both big and small, a means to establish a community within a community. You have people in the churches that are uh, they're from all fields, all, all backgrounds, and uh, if you're out of a job, somebody in the church knows, you know, where there's somebody hiring and uh, can help you. The church is the focal point of a lot of activities. All of the negative things that you hear probably are correct about the West Side. But then again, with an emphasis on the negative, you, don't, you never get around to the positive. And there are tremendous uh, things being done, great things being done by ordinary citizens over West. The church was a spiritual and material magnet for the newly arrived migrants. It was the one institution that made their unfamiliar surroundings seem familiar. Their services were similar to what people knew in the South, and uh, I guess that's another reason for coming <laughs> to the church. So some of our biggest churches really grew during those times. And th there are a lot of reasons why the church was a center of um, attraction for people, for black people. The church was a place of, of not only 
spirituality, but it was a place of um, making contact for things like jobs, uh, things like uh, early education, early childhood education. It, it was not called that then, but it existed. Uh, it was a place to have a uh, good time in the spiritual sense. It was, uh, it was the foundation of the life of the people there. The average church on the west side has not only a ministry for those that can come out on Sunday, but will have a prison ministry, will look after the poor. Many churches have legal clinics. Many will supplement educational training that kids have during the day with after church, after school activities. There's a tremendous amount going on out of these church buildings and with these, these, these church people. One of the things about the church, uh, the, the church is not dependent on the government or on anything else. They're very independent. The, the pastors can be independent because their living doesn't come from the government or some business or something like that. So uh, it's, if they want to speak out on something, it is difficult to, to reach them financially to you know, close them down. Now there may be ways, uh, but uh, generally the independence of, that, of the pastors of those churches has played a big part, I would say, in uh, the effect of the church. Being the oldest established social institution, the church was where these formerly rural people began to learn the nuances of urban living. The church was the center of social and spiritual life. The church was the center of social life and the efforts of the people. What the church sanctions and supports is of the first importance and what it fails to support and sanction is more apt to fail. The Negro church historically as to the numbers and reach of influence and dominion is the strongest factor in the community life of colored people. Aside from the ordinary functions of preaching, prayer, class meeting, and Sunday school, the church is regarded by the masses as a sort of tribune of all their civic and social interest. Thousands of Negroes know and care for no other entertainment than that furnished by the church. Fanny Barrier Williams, 1905. Given the migration patterns of West Side Blacks, Moving into neighborhoods once occupied by Jewish and European immigrants, blacks were able to move into beautiful church structures that used to be the home of white worshipers. And then as the black community moved further west, of course, the churches did too, and they, uh, they bought the churches that were already there. Uh, the church that my grandfather was called to at that time was St. Paul Presbyterian. They eventually sold that church to St. Stephen's AME, and so that's where they are now, and have been there ever since, I think, in 1926, something like that. Presbyterians, Congregationalists, uh, Christian scientists, uh, the Jews built churches in Lawndale. Uh, we do have new churches now. Probably one of the most impressive structures is the Friendship Baptist structure at Laramie and Jackson. It's built architecturally uh, to resemble an African uh, house. Most of the other churches, of course, have taken up space in the churches of other denominations or other religions. Uh, the interesting thing, though, the major point here is that when African Americans move into an edifice, they bring the spirit of the African American interpretation of Christianity in with them. So they take over the buildings and make them into churches. Even for Westsiders who didn't attend church, their southern sensibility of stressing the importance of family created a caring community. As far as camaraderie and closeness was concerned, if the people didn't have anything to eat, everybody shared whatever they had. If you had a pound of beans, Everybody in the neighborhood ate beans. Whatever you had, you shared it with them. And uh, they, we had uh, problems, say, like uh, people were being put out of their homes. At that time, the landlord could set you out on the street for non-payment of rent, and the rent was $15. And uh, 
we, they even had, you know, where they had uh, people set out on the street, whole families, children, everybody. And they would uh, nickel and dime up and maybe get uh, $15 and pay the landlord. And then everybody in the neighborhood move, would move the family right back in the same place they just got put out of. I developed such a tremendous relationship with my sisters with whom I stayed. They lived in the same apartment building until I could get a job. Here they were really taking me in. I mean, I didn't have to really worry about having a place to stay or a place to live with no money. I didn't have to worry about eating because they were both great cooks and they both had young children and families and husbands that they cooked for. And naturally, if they ate, I ate. <laughs> and, and, and it was such a feeling. But then I had friends who came who didn't have relatives who were that close and, and would stay with friends. Uh, my pastor tells the story of coming to Chicago and he claimed that he basically walked and he was looking for a fella and he didn't know where he was going and he was just looking for a fella he had known called Snook <laughs> and that he met somebody on the street <laughs> and asked them if they knew Snook <laughs> and it turned out that they did <laughs> and they took him to where this fella was and therefore he had a place <laughs> to stay. We didn't know what poor was. We, we were a, a happy, cohesive family and, um, you know, the mother and the father uh, was there and, you know, we sat down to dinner um, and those were some of the uh, traits that were carried over from the South. And if you had uh, a problem or if your person died, Everybody would nickel and dime up and uh, see to it that you were buried uh, in cooperation with the local undertakers. Half the time they weren't hardly paid for their services, but it was a community effort. It was something that everybody was you know, quite proud of, that we all hung together. More than half a century before the first major migration, the Lake Street Corridor was already a fully self-sustaining community of black Chicagoans. The Lake Street Corridor uh, was filled with black shops during the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, between Ashland Avenue, 1600 West, and Western, 2400 West. Um, one of the interesting things that a lot of West Adders don't remember or don't know is that there was even a black bank branch on Lake Street before, well, during World War I, there was a South Side branch called the Hunter Brothers Branch Bank, excuse me, that had a branch over on Lake for a short period. But during the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, there were black shop, black shopkeepers that had, that had um, grocery stores, record shops, um, uh, lounges, uh, clothing stores, undertaking establishments, etc. Businesses of all different types, and uh, it was a sort of, you know, really a small self-contained city. I was also known as the Bicycle King in the 30s and early 40s. The people would rent the bicycles for 25 cents an hour. And uh, we would you know, have the bicycles at the three different stations. One time we had as many as 75 to 100 bicycles spread out over the three different stations. And we would take their name and, and address and and their money. I had three record shops. I had the, you know, the record player, and so it was uh, fixed so that people could hear the records being played on the speaker outside. And that was a great help as far as sales were concerned because if people passing by and they hear something that they like, they'd come in. The Lake Street Corridor thrived until the Depression and a city-initiated push to industrialize a large area adjacent to Lake Street. The hub of West Side activities for years was always uh, on either side of Lake Street. And that community was devastated in the late 40s 
by the city's plans to build an industrial uh, corridor north of Lake. And then in the 1950s and 60s, public housing s south of Lake. That's how the Henry Horner homes were built. They moved on the other side of Washington Boulevard. The, uh, the factory redevelopment area that they took was from Lake Street North uh, to the railroad tracks and from Damon Avenue out to California. Once they came in and took all of the uh, property, then uh, you didn't have any choice because the bulldozers followed uh, right along behind the uh, financial transactions. The factory redevelopment and the depression also greatly curbed migration. But the end of the Second World War brought on the second wave. The new black West Siders were taking advantage of the plentiful, good paying jobs in the factories like International Harvester, Sears, and the stockyards. These were jobs that required more brawn than brain and were economic enticement for uprooting rural roots. The West Side, as you know it uh, was a home to Sears Roebuck and Company. It's the place where their catalog operation was born. International Harvester was the, the place where all um, far, large farming equipment was made. McCormick Reaper Factory, it was the home of um, Western Electric, which made all of the telephones for everybody in the country. It was the home to Sunbeam. It was home to Westinghouse. Continental Can, uh, uh, just a, a bevy of, of really large manufacturers. The West Side has worked in heavy and light manufacturing for years. People could trade jobs week to week if they didn't like working for one factory owner. And this was uh, meaningful, very meaningful in the lives of West Siders. People could work and take care of themselves. And there were a lot of jobs on the West Side. You had the manufacturing plants. You had what you might call a garment center. Many people worked and that was around the Maxwell Street area. Uh, you had ice cream factories, you had uh, various kinds of work that ordinary people, people without uh, a good deal of uh, skills, uh, education, uh, could obtain and make a, make a good living. In my days when I was growing up on just north of Lake Street, Walnut, Fulton, yet all kind of businesses so that many of our people were hired by these businesses. They could walk to work. Uh, my sister-in-law worked at uh, uh, Ashland and Lake Street and she retired from there and I mean she could walk there from her home. Old Westsiders and New Westsiders found themselves migrating farther west into areas like Douglas Park, Lawndale, Garfield Park, West Town, and Austin. Housing opened up, and uh, I remember the first move in my family was to Lawndale, to Douglas Park area, and uh, 1947, my mother and father moved out there. They bought a home there, uh, for three flat building for $9,000. Because of the segregation, it was usually pretty crowded. I can remember in my, at my parents' home, one of those apartments was broken up into three parts. That was three different families they rented to. They had a common living room, common kitchen. At this point, people could come to Chicago and they would, many people would come with absolutely nothing if they were able to get their fare because they could move in with a brother, a sister, a cousin. When I came to Chicago, I actually borrowed $50 from my father who borrowed <laughs> $50 from someone else. Now, there were new places to shop and dine, like Madison and Maxwell Streets. All right, I can remember back in the 50s uh, shopping along Madison Street, oh, let's say California to Homan, seeing supermarkets, bakeries, a, uh, a store that produced fresh candy daily, theaters, stationery stores. Oh, I, I missed them, a floral shop. 
There was a clothing store, Becker's, in the 2100 block on Madison. There was an Ashley shoe store on the corner of Hoyne and Madison. I remember all the drugstores there. She always had deliveries of medicines from Hartman's drugstore. And a lot of black young men found work there, uh, working behind the counter. All these drugstores had soda fountains, and uh, they, you know, found work there. I'm talking about Maxwell Street. That's right. A place of many lives and many dreams. I mean, we look forward to the weekends when my dad uh, would take us to Maxwell Street. Uh, we had the side shows. Uh, Sometimes we would go to the, the bakery. Uh, Sometimes we would go with him to watch him kill the chickens that uh, were, were then thrown into this big barrel of hot water and then cleaned. Um, so it was a lot of fun memories. And I remember as a, a youngster um, attending Marshall High School, going down to Maxwell Street to shop for clothing. And I remember the tailors and the, the bargaining and the, the hot dogs and the Polish sausages. Uh, quite a vibrant place. It was never a case of all work and no play for black west siders. The public parks played a pivotal role in providing an oasis from many of the class and race struggles that were a part of turn of the century Chicago. Most African Americans in Chicago had little access to any kind of recreational facilities. Um, and one of the few parks that really did welcome the black people who lived in the community was Union Park. Slowly, um, black children started actually using the park alongside with the white children. So we have some photographs from 1912 that show just a few black children in the waiting pool with the white children. By the 1920s, with the Lake Street Corridor well established, area black residents made it a point to take advantage of Union Park, which was right in their backyard. Over the next few years, uh, the, as the neighborhood, the number of blacks in the neighborhood increased, the use of the park also increased by African-American children. So by um, about 1920, 21, um, about 40 to 50 percent of the use of the park was by African-Americans. The irony of the early integrated park experience is that while the tragic race riot of 1919 was happening at a beachfront on 31st Street, black children were swimming with white children in the Union Park waiting pool as if nothing had ever happened. In 1926, Union Park began a quarter of a century recreational and cultural crusade, thanks to the efforts of a dynamic woman named Anna Walker. She turned out to be a real kind of shaker and mover in the community and particularly in the park. And so she got people very much involved and especially during those depression years, um, the park really became the center of the community. Well, Union Park was a place for recreation. They had the swimming pool, they had the gym. Um, my grandmother had a tremendous program, music and dramatics there. She gave operettas, uh, the Mikado, uh, where she taught the people, uh, the members that were in it, how to sing, how to, how to do it. The park district had costumes. They had a costume shop. They had also scenery, different kind of scenery, backgrounds and she could get that also. One of the things she was really noted for was the music festival. For many, many years they started out with a parade. They used to go from Union Park down to about Garfield Park and then come back. And then that would announce to the whole community that there was a big festival going to take place that night in the ballpark. And the ballpark was filled with people, black and white. He had famous people come there, Joe Lewis. Uh, she had a festival, big festival chorus, directed by some of the great directors, uh, including the father of gospel music, Thomas Dorsey. Uh, he, di he directed festivals there. Ms. Walker did a lot more than directing. Through her writings in various local papers, including the Chicago Defender and the Tribune, she nurtured a sense of West Side pride. During the war years, she did everything in her power to show her patriotism. She turned the field houses into first aid teaching clinics. She held social teas to raise money for Roosevelt College, 
one of the few schools affording blacks a higher education. And before African art was in vogue, she taught young people how to be proud of their heritage by making African masks. The same sense of need for formal recreation existed at numerous parks on the west side. People knew the parks were a major attraction and used them for everything from large family reunions to Tom Thumb weddings to public health campaigns. This was, though it was the third family roundup, this was uh, for the Kennard family, which is my uh, uh, maternal grandmother's uh, family. This was the first one that we had in Chicago. The other two were done down south, which is where my family was originally from, Miss, uh, Mississippi and Tennessee. We rented out the uh, Columbus Park field house. Uh, there were almost about a thousand of us. We had the whole park the entire day, just us. Everywhere you could see was just family, family, family. And this particular the Tom Thumb wedding is one of my um, earlier uh, memories of, of uh, a youth uh, kind of uh, activity. And it was done at the field house in Douglas Park, and it was beautiful. It was one of the most beautiful facilities we had. Um, and it was open to, to us. Uh, the park was lovely. You had wading pools. You had flowers all around. People used to sleep out there at night. Uh, it was just a, a wonderful place to, to be. And I felt very special because uh, it, was, it was my backyard. Well, the Golden Dome is a special spot. Years ago, that uh, site was also a site for health prevention and health promotion. And many people knew about the Golden Dome and saved a lot of lives just by people being able to identify. They didn't know the address, they just knew it was the Golden Dome. Mm. And people who grew up here over here on the west side knew that those kinds of sites were special to us. People also knew about the benefits of the numerous Ys, boys and girls clubs, recreational centers, and church leagues. We had the uh, Maxwell Street YMCA that was located at the corner of Miller and Maxwell. And uh, we were there almost every day. Uh, we had the Chicago Boys Club that was located on Newberry between Maxwell and Roosevelt. We had the Newberry Center that was located on the uh, corner of Newberry and Maxwell. We had Stanford Park that was located on Union in 14 place. And, and by the way, uh, Stanford Park had a large swimming pool, outside swimming pool, and so that's where we did our swimming uh, most of the time during, during the summer. Uh, occasionally we would go to uh, Grand Park and swim in the lake, uh, but of course that was a no-no, uh, but we did it anyway. One of the institutions uh, that really helped me as a young person was the old Midwest Boys Club located at 2950 West Washington. For the last 30 years, it's been called the Dr. Martin Luther King Boys and Girls Club. At Midwest Boys Club, uh, I met uh, professional African-American men, most from the South Side, who would help boys with their athletic skills, but more importantly for me, encourage those with academic interests to pursue their interests to the highest level. The thing that was interesting about these places, if you got into a conflict with a guy, they take you downstairs and you put the boxing gloves on, and you boxed, the best man won, over, you all became friends, you, you know, that friendship, you know, was put together again. So the, the, the hostilities were not there. Uh, we usually settled them right away. There was, first of all, the Off the Street Club, which was, uh, Warner Saunders was involved with um, back then on Sacramento and Jackson, uh, right around that location where we would uh, play after school. And then there was Merillac, uh, Merillac House, which all of us came through. It was an outdoor uh, concrete slab where you got your indoctrination. I mean, they would put you on your back and you had to get up. That's where we played Crane. And, and then there was the, um, uh, the Boys Club on uh, Washington where we would come back after we were in college. We would come back and play in the summer tournaments. And that was like um, um, coming back home. Henry Horner was always special for practically every African-American youth uh, growing up. It was a center of recreation for us. It represented opportunity. Uh, it's the first time I learned how to play a drum or to blow a horn. I uh, learned how to uh, fine-tune my basketball skills a little bit more. And um, it, was, it was great. I mean, it was all that opportunity. Now, when you go back historically, though, a lot of the old-timers will talk about the Wendell Phillips Settlement House down at Walnut and Damon. It's no longer there and they talk about 
what was happening there 70, 80 years ago. But the prime mover uh, in terms of social life and recreation, the place that kept kids active and off the streets was the church. And people will talk about church leagues back in the 30s and 40s, intramural sports that had West and South Siders playing baseball and basketball and what have you. The church has been the main mover and still remains very active. Another league that kept players and crowds very active were the high school basketball leagues. None brought more pride to the West Side than Marshall's 1958 championship team. We were all very proud in 1958 when John Marshall High School sent a team downstate and brought back a state championship in basketball. Now DuSable had tried it in 53-54. They were cheated. Marshall tried it in 55. Marshall succeeded in 1958. So that was a great, we had a great sense of pride. When we got on the floor, when we started playing basketball, it was a lot of fun. It was just going up and down the court, and that I knew I could do. And we were all on the same page. And uh, uh, that year, every place we went, uh, crowds came out because everybody on our team could dunk the ball. So we would start this line where, you know, we were doing two-handed dunks and, and, you know, we, we were doing it better than the pros, so uh, 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 performing before uh, full houses, uh, packed houses, and, uh, and winning. I mean, we, uh, we won, <laughs> uh, and uh, so uh, a, a lot of fun memories. While much was going on for the youth, adult Westsiders were not left out of the mix. While jazz was king on the south side, it was the sound of the down-home blues that filled many a night spot along Lake and Madison. The main hot spots were uh, the club playtime, which was located about in the 2200 block on Lake Street, and also Martin's Corner, owned by uh, you know, Jim Martin. You had big Jim Martin, who had a, uh, he was a kind of the political Boss, he was a numbers man. He had the big numbers business on the west side. And he had a very, uh, very interesting uh, bar, tavern, we called them in those days. And they had good music. And those of us from the south side would go to uh, Martin's Corner, 1900 West Lake Street. And many celebrities like Joe Lewis and the Box of uh, Sugar Ray and, and the people in, the, in that sports area would go to Big Jim Martin's because there was always something good, jazz and blues and, of course, good fellowship. We had clubs like uh, the Oasis, uh, Jazzville, the Twin Doors, the Triple Z. That was a group of Westsiders. Every year they gave what they call the Tigers Ball. And anybody that was anybody on the West Side attended the Tigers Ball. And so that meant you know, getting your best garments together, which in most instances, me and my buddies would have a new outfit from head to toe. You couldn't wear something that you had already worn and be in the know. I mean, uh, so, so that's what we do. We, we, would, we would attend those affairs. And then you, you, you'd see generations of, of folk from that area. I mean, some of the folks might be in their 60s or 70s, but they were from the west side. And see, so you, you, you had that camaraderie there. You know, it was a lot of fun. By the late 1950s, Chicago's west side, like the rest of the nation, was undergoing a critical change that would reshape the country's constitution and consciousness. Over the last 30 years, the West Side has had its share of problems, primarily due to economic uh, dislocation that was global in scope. Uh, the jobs just disappeared. Then there was the rioting of the 60s, and something happened in the 1950s that's significant. Uh, there was a tremendous exodus from Douglas Park and from the Lake Street corridor area of families that had been on the West Africa for many, many years. 
I like to refer to it as a brain drain, but I don't want to offend anybody who's still left on the West Side, such as myself. But there was a brain drain, a leadership drain, tremendous, as people could move far south into Park Manor, into Chatham. They could move west into the suburb of Maywood. Uh, that hurt us. Uh, there were many like myself who had grown up on the West Side, uh, who were uh, wedded to it and impassioned about it, but who ended up moving. There was a brain drain. And so you had um, the, the next generation, which would have been mine, and the one uh, closely behind me, that would have brought um, the, the skills and talents and energies that we had learned from being in the North, the first generation born North. We took them uh, and traveled elsewhere. Another thing that traveled elsewhere were the plentiful jobs that created a stable community. This used to be the international headquarters for Sears, Roebuck and Company. And a great deal of what happened to urban America happened with Sears Roebuck. That is, they moved out of the inner city. I mean, 10,000 people worked here. This was a thriving community, city of its own. The west side of Chicago, the greater west side of Chicago, as we know it, lost 120,000 manufacturing jobs over a 30-year period. Not only did Sears leave, but International Harvester left, Western Electric left, Motorola left, Zenith left, Hot Point left, Allied Radio. I mean, you can just name them and name them on. What started out being a very um, um, life-giving, fulfilling kind of community kind of gave way to um, a gang atmosphere simultaneous with um, the creation and establishment and the operation of these gangs and the gang element you begin to see um, a deterioration of the housing uh, slowly but surely um, uh, families that I grew up with began to move away civil rights and black power clashed as the Black Panthers preached black consciousness Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached racial reconciliation and jobs it was a shot in the arm for West Side activists and West Side residents. Dr. King would go to Edna's a lot and have lunch, and you know people would just kind of flock in to to hear him. Here he is with his wife, being seen looking out the window of a West Side property. It had to have an impact. So I had the privilege of, of um, listening to Dr. Martin Luther King as a teenager, two early teens. Uh, he was brought to Chicago by the Londell People's Planning and Action Council uh, in the 60s, and uh, he um, uh, spoke at several churches on the west side. This is when they were organizing the, the garbage men and also the construction uh, trade protests and that kind of thing to, to get more access for African Americans, at that time, males. He inspired me because uh, about three or four years later, I became an activist myself working again with Londell People's Planning and Action um, Council. They uh, went on to, be, uh, to become the founders of Pyramid West and also uh, the Community Bank of Londell and became responsible for most of the rehab housing up and down Douglas Boulevard, which is beautiful. What was not beautiful was seeing the West Side go up in flames caused by violent riots following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. When I left high school, I went to Northwestern. After Northwestern, when I came back, I was in a National Guard. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, I'm, after the King riots in 68, I'm patrolling the west side of Chicago with an M1. And I'm seeing uh, the same area that I grew up in burn. And people uh, uh, coming up to me, and my, I was a, pl uh, a, a, a platoon sergeant, and knowing who I was. And I would, you know, uh, uh, have to tell them to hold their distance because uh, you can't congregate in more than three. If you do, we have to arrest you. And we had live ammunition. Was, was you know, uh, it, it went from uh, going to Little Jack's and being fed to seeing that community burn. And uh, it was devastating. It, it was truly devastating. And, and, and again, most of the of the National Guardsmen uh, who I was in charge of were white. They had no connection with that community whatsoever. 
I can remember some of the actual riots and I can recall the glee on people's faces as they were participating. I mean, I remember being in the car with a friend of mine who came from a very middle-class family. As a matter of fact, a uh, school is named after his father. Um, we're driving down the street, and I say to him, look, you're running the lights and stuff. You gotta, I say, you know, joking. I said, the police are going. He said, today we're all the police. The next thing I knew, he had driven his car into an A&P store and had gotten out and started throwing cartons of cigarettes and things into the car. And I'm saying, why are you doing this? You don't need any cigarettes. You can buy cigarettes if you want them. I mean, you got a job. I'm, so I stepped to the side, <laughs> you know. Hey, I don't want to be embarrassed here with this guy getting these cigarettes. I mean, I'm a young school teacher and stuff, you know what I mean? And I'm saying people felt that they were venting emotion and frustration that was welled up inside of them for long times before. Out of the ashes, although not evident at the time, arose the material for future renaissance of the West Side, as changes were made to the educational landscapes that still stand tall today. As a teenager, uh, at being inspired by Dr. King, I saw that you could do something. You know, people getting together could actually do something and change uh, their community for the better. So when I ended up going to high school, one of the things that we saw was that there, were, there was no African-American history. This was at Harrison High. Also, there was no Latino history. Also, there were no uh, African-American or Latinos on the um, uh, administration. Uh, there were in terms of faculty. So we started organizing and talking, and before we knew it, we, were, uh, or we had organized walkouts uh, at Harrison, and over a period of four months, it grew citywide. I got a chance then to meet people like uh, Reverend Jackson. This also, um, Nancy Jefferson, um, Londell People's Planning and Action, all of them sort of rallied around us after we got things going. We were the first student body to, to, to be asked by the Board of Education to meet with them. As a result of that particular experience, uh, we did get um, African American history in integrated uh, into the curriculum, also Latino history was the first time. Uh, we also got uh, six principals removed, inclu including our own, for racist attitudes. Um, we also got got what now is the local um, advisory councils to the school board. We got the first semblance of that by getting PTA, um, uh, PTAs to hold meetings in the evenings. They only held them at that time in the afternoons, which meant most, most of our parents couldn't come because they were working. So that was the beginning of that structure back then. As changes were made at the Chicago Public Schools, educator Marva Collins reshaped elementary education with her West Side Preparatory Academy. At the collegiate level, Westsiders demanded a school of their own and got one in Malcolm X College. There's something special about Malcolm X College because its very inception came from the empowerment of the, of the West Side of Chicago, of the students who were um, a part of the movement for an institution for us, by us, uh, which reflected the, the very values of uh, Malcolm El Haj Malik El Shabazz. This community demanded this institution from the name of the institution to the way it is constructed to the, the, um, the artwork that you find reflecting the culture of, of um, black people. Um, to the fact that the community continues to embrace this institution. Uh, we are celebrating our 30th year, 30 years as Malcolm X College, and many, many people thought it wouldn't last. We are here, we've been here for 30, and we'll be here for 30 more. For more than two decades, the West Side suffered decay and depression. Still, many area residents and community-based organizations remained keeping guard of an area they loved and knew would rise again. 
with all the different pressures, with all the different challenges uh, that I think many of the people on the West Side faced, the promise of hope that was unfulfilled, um, trying to seek employment, uh, trying to deal with impoverished conditions, uh, dealing with the riots uh, in the 60s and so on down the line, with all those different kinds of pressures, I think that it eventually began to beat many people down over here. But as we well know, there was a solid nucleus of folks that refused to give in, that refused to say it's all over and refused to give up hope. And they've sustained the West Side. There's no question about that. Uh, those families, certain institutions like HSI, they've been here to continue to put the effort in. There were actually almost two decades that went by when the city didn't do anything to rebuild North Lawndale at all from the riots. With the uh, Lawndale um, Theater, that was the first new major construction that um, um, and also a couple of uh, the um, uh, food chains are, are building over there aside from what Lando people planning and action pyramid west tried to do with rehabbing housing in terms of businesses that's that's just recently starting to happen in the last five years they're having a revival actually of union park the neighborhood regentrification has set in and uh, there's a lot of it going on just east of union park and so now where you only saw black faces in Union Park. Now you see white and black in there. Uh, Michael Jordan has opened up a restaurant there at uh, Ogden and Randolph and a uh, very expensive one I understand. Haven't been there yet but they have a dramatic program now. The young lady that's working with it is a member of our church and she was saying she she appreciates what my grandmother did you know there and she she wants to carry on in the same tradition. We have to have a real solid view of who we are uh, and how we play into this global market because as we go into a new millennium it's going to call for a, a global kind of consciousness and that global kind of consciousness is going to uh, uh, only be successful if we are connected back to from whence we come. Professional photographer Jerry Gibson makes it her life's passion to document from whence she came and where her people are going through photography. She teaches her art to young Westsiders so they can leave a lasting legacy of their own. Photography is not for every kid. It is something different and it's very hard to get African American kids to try something new and do something different. So when they come into photography and they learn something and they like it, then uh, I call that <laughs> success right there. And of course now with the redevelopment, uh, this community is going through another change. Uh, and you know, I might add that has been another objective of this photography program with the kids uh, is to capture this community, their community, their lives before uh, the change takes place. The program uh, Exodus to Excellence that I, I, I dreamed of years ago, I, w I took this idea into the legislature and it's a ten million dollar uh, vision to revitalize the, the West Side and the hope is that we revitalize the West Side by investing in our children, by investing in uh, in, in, in their basic uh, moral values by giving them some direction relative to uh, opportunities for employment and preparing them with the kind of worth ethic that our foreparents brought with them from the South. Our parents taught us about work ethics because they experienced it, but we somehow were not able to transfer those worth ethics to our to this youth, to this new generation. Exodus Excellence Rites of Passage is a socialization process of helping young people ages 12 to 19 develop leadership skills that will prepare them for adult responsibilities. But we take the position that uh, our children can indeed learn and with the proper nurturing and with a value system and the proper direction from adult role models, they can overcome many of the hurdles that we know exist in our community today. We are a part of the uh, concept of uh, tourism and West Side uh, preservation of historic sites. We have field trips to uh, community events uh, here on the West Side. We want them to not only know about schools 
uh, such as Malcolm X College, which we want many of them to enroll and go on to higher education, but we also want them to know about cultural activities. Uh, there are bookstores, there are community organizations, there are youth centers, there are many uh, religious and social and business uh, enterprises and other uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, projects that exist on the West Side. Like a newly discovered gold mine, the West Side is ripe for redevelopment and rebirth, but with special considerations. The key there is to make sure that there's an opportunity for folks who have been there, lifelong residents, uh, an opportunity to partake in the new West Side, uh, to be able to, in fact, um, have an opportunity to purchase affordable housing. We see the Home and Square developments going up. There's a lot of housing development going on on the West Side. Practically every vacant lot uh, on the West Side of Chicago is being targeted for some type of housing or industrial development, and that's very, very exciting. Uh, we just heard recently that Central City Productions is about to build a hundred million dollar uh, TV studio over here on the West Side in North Lawndale community on a former uh, former dump site. If we did built this uh, studio just in, in, in downtown, uh, it still might be difficult for blacks to come into that environment. Uh, we might get caught up, the people who might get caught up, but see, when they go to the West Side <laughs> in Rose von Cosner, there will be no question of where they are and uh, what they should be doing in that community. Don has had this dream for quite some time that he really wanted to anchor right back in the community where he grew up, community that has been a part of him, community that he has been a part of. I see, well, the churches, uh, revitalization of the park, newcomers coming in, which I think will vitalize the community. Uh, newcomers are welcome into the community, and because uh, all these vacant lots, you know, uh, they, they need homes on them. But we, what we don't want is to, to uh, make it black removal. And uh, where and what will happen is that you're, you're not removed just that you're black so you get out, but taxes go up. And if you're, a lot of people are retired, owning their homes, you know, I've owned them for years and years. And um, if taxes go too high, you know, they won't be able to stay in them. And so they end up having to move. When looking at the black history of Chicago's West Side, it must be viewed in its entirety. The great achievements and failures of the past can only pave the way for greater gains in the future. If we deal with the history of Chicago, we cannot deal with it accurately unless we deal with the, uh, with the, uh, the behavior, with the lifestyle, with the culture of the, of the black community. Everyone likes to remember what their roots are. This is part of our way of uh, remembering what our roots are, even though it might be just a you know, little portion of the history of the city of Chicago, but we want to let them know that at one time that uh, the West Side was there, and we want everybody to know it. <laughs>